good morning everybody welcome to this uh, very exciting event this event is not a regular lecture uh, here uh, what we are going to do is that uh, first 25 to 30 minutes uh, we will have uh, Steve Downs talk about uh, his perspective on how we can build health in uh, our regular life and uh, I will tell you a little bit more about Steve in a minute. But then we'll have Bradley Horowitz who is sitting there uh, listening to the talk and uh, preparing how he's going to give a difficult time to Steve <laughs> uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of his views and discuss things like that. Uh, Steve has a very interesting perspective on health because he has been working on the, uh, Robert Johnson Wood Foundation for quite some time as uh, Chief Technology and Innovation Officer. Uh, and because of the foundation's work, their effort has been to build health as an integral part of the culture. And that is very different than looking at health as a cancer problem or heart problem and uh, this kind of problem. It takes a very different view of how we are going to start looking at health as much more uh, long-term and uh, humanistic problem. So you will hear his perspective here. I was very impressed by some of his writing. That's when I contacted and we got into some very interesting discussions. And uh, from there, uh, we started interacting. So I wanted you to hear some of his perspective. Uh, then will come uh, Bradley Horowitz. Uh, Bradley, I had the pleasure of knowing it for a few years. I think uh, I have seen him grow from uh, an undergraduate student in my lab at the University of Michigan to climb through different ladders at uh, Yahoo to Google. Uh, and he has very interesting perspective because I don't think there is anybody in this room who is not using the product that he had championed. He worked with Google Mail, he worked with Google Photos, Google Plus, and so he had seen how to make some of these things extremely popular. And uh, he is now, uh, after serving as president or vice president of uh, Google, now he decided to become advisor to them and he spent some of his time thinking about health. So that's why he is a good person to compliment on what you are going to hear from his team, and then we'll bring it back. Okay, that's it. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Ramesh. I'm, I'm delighted to, to be here. I'm delighted to be part of this lecture series, and, and thrilled that Bradley's going to join me um, for conversation later. Um, I'm going to give a, a talk about the interplay of technology and everyday life and health. And so sort of just to give you a quick plan, um, I'm going to start with some big picture observations and sort of where we are in health in the U.S. and, and spoiler alert, it's not so good. Um, uh, then I'll do something of a reframing of, of the problem uh, as I see it. Reflect a little bit on how we got where we are today um, uh, and then do a little bit of, a, of what the designers would call a how might we, to really try to think out loud about how might we turn this around. Um, and I would say it's, this is very much a work in progress. As Ramesh and I were talking earlier, I'll probably raise a whole lot more questions than I'll answer, um, but I'd really love to get your, your feedback on all of this. Um, the other thing I would say is if you're the kind of person who is inclined to tweet, um, I would suggest go ahead, don't hold back. I always find that um, a really valuable form of feedback. So how are we doing on health? Um, this is a graph, some of you may have seen this, that plots life expectancy by per capita health expenditure. Uh, for the 20 or so most industrialized nations. And the lines represent the march of the data points over time. And you can see the U.S. is kind of up here, sort of way over as an outlier. And Okay, so we have the lowest life expectancy, but at least we're number one in spending. Um, and actually, that's 2014 data. So in the last in a few years have not really been kind uh, to this chart. So life expectancy actually dipped slightly down for three years in a row after this. Uh, before ticking back up about a month um, in the most recent data point. Spending, on the other hand, has continued to rise um, uh, unabated. Um, so not only is, and we're 
I guess what I'm getting at here is this is really big and complex, very high level, a lot underneath these numbers. But I think the takeaway here is that something is pretty far off, right? We, our performance is not sort of slightly uh, suboptimal. Um, it's really, really bad. Um, and not only is it really bad, it's terribly unjust. Um, and so this is an infographic, part of a series that we supported that looks at health, life expectancy by different neighborhoods in different parts of the country. This is New York City, and I want to call your attention to the difference between East Harlem with 76 years of life expectancy versus Murray Hill on the Lower East Side of 85 years. And that's about, you know, sort of eight, nine stops on the 456 train. You're getting nine years difference in life expectancy. So I think it's also helpful to look at this through the lens of time. Um, and this is Americans with Diabetes, plotted from 1960, uh, when we had less than 1% less than of Americans with diabetes, to today where we're about 7 or so percent, with an actual projection that we hit at 14% at the end of the decade. Um, and I think just, just look at the shape of that curve. Um, and now let's go to obesity, since obesity is often a, a sort of precursor to type 2 diabetes. The green line is Americans with obesity, which has gone from about 14% to actually new data came out last week. Um, the current uh, percent of Americans living with obesity is 42.6. Um, so a tripling over that time. The blue line is severe obesity, um, and that's gone from less than a percent to 9.2%, uh, I think, in the most recent number. Um, uh, with actual projections of that hitting 24% um, by 2030. I think, I think the regular obesity about 50% um, by 2030. And what I'm not showing on this graph is the percent of Americans who are overweight, which is sort of holding relatively constant at about 30, 30 plus um, percent. Um, so another way to look at this is actual, the weight of the average American male um, has gone up 32 pounds over this time period from, I think it's 1960 to 2016. Not much better for women, it's plus 31. Um, some of this has to do with food, um, and we're eating more than we used to. So increase in daily calories is up 24% between 1961 and 2013. We don't get a ton of physical activity. Less than 5% of Americans get 30 minutes a day. Um, and sort of beyond the weight and fitness, we're seeing disturbing trends in other areas, like mental health. So these are increases in depressive symptoms for teens and young adults over the past sort of 8 to 12 years. Um, there's also increasing reports of loneliness. There was a recent survey that suggested 61% of working Americans uh, were scoring in the lonely level uh, on, a, on a loneliness scale. Um, and we're not sleeping as much either. So in 1960, fewer than 2% of Americans were getting sort of on average less than six hours a night of sleep. Um, and that number is now 33%. And sleep is so integral uh, to so many aspects of our health. Another thing that's really good for us is getting outdoors. You know, humans are designed to be outdoor creatures. Um, but we actually spend almost all of our time indoors. We spend 87% of our time indoors, 7% outdoors. And see, we actually, that's barely more than the time we spend inside our car. Uh, our car. Um, so I just want to sort of pause and kind of connect the dots across. Um, yes? Um, does the time spent in the car count as time spent no. outdoor? No. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, okay, the only one person really, you know. No, no, no. no. It's, it's, not, it's not as bad as you think. Yeah. yeah it's, it's not good, but it's not as bad as you think. Um, so just to connect the dots across these, I, I would sort of say three things. One is, we're not talking about sort of problems at the margins of society. I mean, this is, this is pervasive, these health issues. They're endemic. Um, second thing is, as you saw from some of the charts comparing us to, to 1960, it wasn't always this way, right? This is, this is something that has really happened, really unfolded over the course of two to three generations. Um, uh, and, and it's very much a modern day phenomenon. Uh, and then the third thing uh, I would say is that it's getting worse, right? The trends on all of these are not getting better. They're getting worse. And, and all of this leads me to a, a pretty simple conclusion, which is that it's hard to be healthy in the U.S. today. And it's actual hard work. It's a daily struggle to try to maintain 
your health. And there's, there's even a perspective on this from evolutionary biology that says we've actu we are actually not suitably evolved for the world we've created. Right? So let me just read you this quote. It's from a book by Dan Lieberman. It's a wonderful book called The Story of the Human Body. And the quote is, the fundamental answer to why so many humans are now getting sick from previously rare illnesses is that many of the body's features were adapted in environments from which we evolved, but have become maladapted in the modern environments we've created. So what happens is we, we've changed our environments, we've changed the circumstances in which we live at a rate that's much faster than our genome can keep up. Um, and the way I see this is that we're swimming upstream, right? Every day we are swimming upstream to try to stay healthy. And, and I want to be clear that that's not impossible. A lot of people are doing it. A lot of people are doing it very well. Um, this guy, for example, has it figured out. Right, so this guy is swimming upstream like Michael Phelps. Um, you know, he is definitely getting his 30 minutes of a day of physical activity. Um, but the problem with solutions like this, and of course this is sort of a cartoon, uh, but even the less extreme solutions like this, is they're not accessible to everybody. So, so when you have this situation that we're all swimming upstream, it's advantaging people uh, with resources. I also think it's helpful to look at this through the lens of design. And, and there's this interesting quote from a, a terrific new book by Cliff Kwong and Robert Fabricant on the history of user-centered design. And they say, seeing humans as they are, instead of what they're supposed to be, was one of the great unappreciated intellectual shifts of the 20th century. What they were getting at with that was they said the product designers used to sort of design the product as they thought it ought to work, how it ought to look. And then they figured they could always train humans to use it. Right? You can always teach them how to use it. And then they shifted and said, no, you know, humans are imperfect. They're flawed. They have weaknesses. They have all these tendencies that make us human. You need to factor that in from the beginning. Factor that in to your design. Um, and the way, I th excuse me, the way I think about this is, when you think about some of the numbers I quoted before, and just the, how widespread some of our health challenges are, I don't think we can think of this as user error. Right? It's really much more about fundamental design flaws in how we've constructed society. Think about what Dan Lieberman says in terms of this idea of a mismatch. Right? We've created a society that doesn't match our fundamental nature as humans. Um, so, I feel like we haven't really heeded this lesson. We haven't applied this thinking when it comes to health. Because if you go back to the sort of notion of swimming upstream, most of our responses to that are to try to train people to be better swimmers or give them tools to be better swimmers, maybe even give them drugs to be better swimmers. Um, or we try to motivate them to swim harder, right? Um, and don't get me wrong, because there's really important work being done to do that. And it's essential, it's vital work to try to help people to cope with the world we live in. Um, but there's also an element of it that, that sort of rings of, of what political scientist Jacob Hacker calls seeking personal solutions to public problems. Right? Sort of seeking to help individuals come up with solutions for individuals to deal with the conditions that society has created. And when you think about it, at the end of the day, we're still swimming upstream. We're still swimming upstream. Um, and the currents, are, if anything, are getting stronger. And so I think we have to be much bolder and much more radical in our thinking. Um, and the question I think we should be asking is, what would it take to reverse the direction of the river? What would it take so that just going about your everyday life naturally led, led to better health? So that you wouldn't need a Fitbit to tell, me, tell you how many steps you've taken each day because you always get plenty of steps because that's just how your life is. So I think we have to reimagine all the fundamentals of everyday life. Reimagine how we eat, how we sleep, how we get from place to place, how we socialize, how we entertain ourselves. And not just sort of take that all as givens. Not just sort of say, well, this is the way we do things today because we've always done them this way and we always will but really challenge those. And to do that, I think we have to go back and, and reflect on, on sort of where we came from. Um, and so I'll ask the question that David Byrne likes to ask, well, how did we get here?
Does anybody remember David Byrne? <laughs> a couple of folks. Um, so for me, it actually starts with this quote from Winston Churchill. We shape our buildings thereafter they shape us. Um, and there have been a number of riffs on this. Um, it's been said that Marshall McLuhan's philosophy amounted to we shape our tools thereafter they shape us. And I think it's true. Our tools, our technologies definitely shape us. And they do so by determining what's possible and what's not, what's easy and what's hard, and ultimately what's culturally normal from culturally abnormal. Um, and I'll just illustrate this with a few examples. Thomas Edison, when he created the electric light bulb, fundamentally changed the experience of nighttime. And you can draw a line from Henry Ford and the introduction of the Model T to the daily commute that looks like this for 87% of Americans get back and forth to work like this in cars, um, to connect to the suburban housing developments that look like this. The invention of the magic box that somehow projects moving pictures that are beamed from the sky uh, led to Americans spending an average of five hours a day watching it. And Steve Jobs brought us the iPhone, and with it, the behavior that we see all around us every day. Um, so technology has clearly shaped our lives. And let's be clear, it has brought us untold magic and wonder. I mean, we are truly living in an amazing world. Um, but what we're seeing is that health and well-being haven't automatically come along for the ride. Um, and so if we know this, then the question becomes, how can it shape them to be healthier? And the short answer is that we don't know, and that it's really, really going to be hard. Um, but I want to offer a few sort of thoughts on, on how we might try to bring it about. Um, and I'm going to start by introducing the concept of health positive tech. Um, and I'm going to frame this as a series of from to shifts. Um, but I also want to be clear that I'm not saying we need to stop doing the froms and only do the twos. It's about sort of opening up our thinking and, and perhaps shifting the emphasis a bit. So the first thing I would say is we want to move from helping people overcome the challenge of being healthy to helping reduce the challenge of being healthy. And this is sort of that notion of reversing the direction of the river. Right? So it's about changing the environments and the circumstances more than changing the people. Okay? Next one is about going from healthy behaviors being something we add on top of our everyday lives, our normal lives, um, to having healthy behavior or healthy lives result from living your healthy, everyday life. And I'll just give, illustrate this by giving this, talking about the ritual of the workout. Think about what a workout is, right? You sort of like take time, you go to the gym, you, you run on a treadmill or something. It's an activity that we're solely doing in order to improve our health. Um, and it, it's not part of how we live our life, it's just something we add on. It's sort of like taking a vitamin supplement because your diet isn't sufficient. Um, contrast that with just imagining if our everyday lives just included so much activity that we wouldn't have to add it on uh, at the end. So the third shift is from pushing behaviors trying to convince people to do things, persuade them to do things, to pulling behaviors by creating uh, opportunities and experiences that just naturally attract people because they're desirable, they're fun, they're easy. Um, two, two ways of thinking about this. One is um, there's some research lately that suggests is, what is the best way to get people to eat vegetables? It's to make them taste good, <laughs> right? Make them taste good. Um, the other example I would use actually is, is Tesla. So Elon Musk could have designed a really boring, ugly car that was lame to drive and say, but you should drive it because it's good for the planet. But he didn't do that. He created a car that was so much fun and so exciting and so much better to drive than, uh, than <coughs> gasoline-powered alternatives. So people said, wow, that's cool. I want to do that. Right? So another shift is to go from the idea of individual responsibility for choices made to collective responsibility for choices available. And it, I don't want to argue that no one should have any accountability or responsibility for their own choices. But I think we know that our choices are terribly inequitably distributed. I mean, frankly, I don't think they're great for all of us. And so I think we can put much more emphasis on trying to create better opportunities for people. <coughs> 
So we often think of health as a vertical market, right? There's health, there's education, there's various markets that we can sort of organize around um, and sell to. And that's true of health care, right? There's a whole health care industry, defined players, you know, lots of money to be made. Health is different. Health is really the outcome of many, many different influences throughout all sectors and many aspects of our lives. And so the way we produce it is to value it in all of those contexts. And sort of a quick corollary is for, um, for companies to think almost less of a creating a division that focuses on health and more of a how do you look at all of our products in this company and ask how they're either influencing health positively or negatively. Um, and I'll give a, an example of an illustration of this, and, and it's perfect because we have Bradley um, in the audience, is Google Maps. And Google Maps is not a health product. It's a wayfinding product. Um, but the choices that Google makes about which modes of transportation it preferences um, or makes easy influence the behaviors people undertake in terms of which transport modes they use. So we all know that walking and biking is better for you than driving a car or using public transportation. And so again, no shade at Google, but my point is simply that whatever their design choices around that is going to have a positive or negative influence. And so it's worth being intentional about. So the next... Um, what I'm going to do is show a few examples of products that I think illustrate these shifts a bit. And I'm not going to hold these out as paragons, but I think they'll give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So the first is Lyft. And I, I can't tell if you can see the detail here. But we think of Lyft as you know, the app that you tap to get a car to come pick you up. But in a number of cities, Lyft is starting to add public transportation directions. Um, and they're adding scooter rentals. And so just in the same way I was talking about Google Maps, they're actually making it easier to do healthier forms of transportation. So they're shifting that balance and lowering the barrier. Second is prepared meal kits. And you know, there are lots of issues with prepared meal kits. But if you think about the process of cooking a healthy dinner at night, there's a lot of steps involved. It's pretty daunting for a lot of people. And what a prepared meal kit does is cut out about four of those steps um, and make it a lot easier to do. So again, lowering that barrier to a healthy behavior. The third is Flux. How many people here use Flux or know about Flux? Yeah, so a, hand, a handful. Um, basically, it's an extension you can add to your laptop that removes the blue light from your screen in the hours leading up to bedtime. Because uh, blue light has been shown to suppress melatonin, which is the hormone that helps you get a little bit sleepy. Um, it's a subtle effect, but what I like about this conceptually is that it's not an app that's reminding you to go to bed. It's not an app that says you need to get good sleep tonight. It's an app that subtly changes the environment to make it more conducive to fall asleep. Um, and then the last example is Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go is not about health, right? Pokemon Go is entertainment. It's a game. People play it because it's fun. Um, but what does it do? It gets you outdoors, gets you moving around, often with friends. So it's, it's pulling several good health behaviors with something that's really not about health per se. So, how might we start to bring about more products like this, more innovation around these kinds of things, and, and sort of move in this health positive tech direction? Um, just a, a few thoughts. Uh, first, I think we're going to need alignment sort of throughout the country around some broad health goals. And, and I think the, the analogy I might use is around carbon emissions. Obviously, there's a lot of work to be done there. but. You can't argue that most people, most companies, don't know that fewer carbon emissions is really important, um, and that they all bear some responsibility for moving in that direction. And if we can find some similar things around health, where we can say we all need to be kind of rowing in the same direction um, on this. The second is I actually think we need a more nuanced understanding of health and behavior. Um, and what I mean by this is that I. I think we have a tendency sometimes to be reductionist about our thinking here. And we, we target very specific things to change. You know, we target weight, or we target cholesterol, or we target sleep or depression. Um, and so much of this is deeply interconnected. So um, I'm going to show you a diagram that, trust me, is not scientifically rigorous. Uh, it's illustrative. But think of a handful of behaviors, like getting outdoors, eating, sleeping connecting socially, and then think about sort of like your everyday states of being, your mood, your cognitive function, your energy level, um, uh, even your pain, your stress. 
And then think about how connected all these things are. And, and this is, again, not scientific. This was me just off the top of my head saying, where are the connections that I can think about right now? Um, and think of these as feedback loops, right? All of these things are massively interconnected. Um, and I think having sort of more insight into this um, will help us better identify targets um, that we should be trying to innovate around. Um, and I think there's an interesting question of, do we try to encourage sort of problem solving around specific health outcomes, or do we try to encourage problem solving around behaviors? Um, and I'm kind of leaning toward behaviors. Uh, I did a, a post a few years ago um, in which I identified what I call a starter set of about five behaviors. Cooking dinner, kind of moving more throughout your day, getting better sleep, connecting socially, getting outdoors. And again, it's not a, a scientifically sort of rank prioritized list so much as if we start getting a lot of people doing those things, we're going to be moving in the right direction. And then I think finally, um, or actually, sorry, not finally, but uh, then comes the really interesting creative uh, innovation part, is actually getting the products and services, getting the solutions, getting the, the tools, all the things that help start to induce those behaviors. I think that's the exciting part. Um, uh, Tim Brown from IDEO uh, was sort of talking about this in this context of how do you catalyze massive parallel innovation? Um, and I think that's going to be really important here. And then the last thing I think is actually about tools to understand impact. Um, and a lot of times we design products with intentions about what people will use, will use them for and how they'll use them. But I think it's important to close that loop and really understand how they are doing it. And I think it's particularly interesting to think about how online products and services lead to offline behavior. That's going to be really important to measure. So I'm going to start to bring this to a close um, by sort of pointing out something really obvious, particularly in this building, which is we're living at a time of technological marvel. Um, and it's only going to get more amazing, right? There's so many incredible technologies that are emerging and that are even those that aren't emerging are, are in, the, in, the, in the pipelines, uh, in the laboratories. Um, we don't yet know how all of those technologies are going to combine to form the products and services that will become the new normal for our everyday lives. But we know that they will. And when they do, they're either going to make it easier to be healthy or they're going to make it harder. And so I think we have to be really intentional about that and really try to align around a goal of better health for all. Um, so I will now close with a quick plug. Uh, my colleague Thomas Getz has put together a website called Building H, uh, which is sort of a resource for some uh, information about this kind of perspective and this problem. Um, if, if this has inspired you at all and you want to work on this, um, please check out the site. We also have a newsletter that uh, puts out about two issues a month just to sort of pass on developments of interest uh, related to this and it's sort of a way to stay connected to the community. So with that, thank you very much, and I'm happy to have Bradley come on up. So thank you very much, Steve. And I mentioned we want to do now an experiment that uh, Bradley will come and start discussing, based on his experiences, how do you bring some of these very useful things that we talked about to real practice so that society adopts, using your metaphor, can we develop new technology that's going to induce healthy behavior in us? With that, Bradley, All right. can you tell a minute about yourself? Oh, well, first of all, uh, thank you, Ramesh, for having me. And Ramesh is a great mentor and friend who I have known since I was an undergraduate. And, you know, certainly I would not have had the opportunity to do the things uh, I've done without his support. So thank you for having me today and everything. Um, and thank you, Steve, as well. I'm really excited by that presentation, and I have a lot of questions. I'm sure you all have a lot of questions. So my goal will be sort of interstitial to get us going and then hopefully turn it over to you all for some more great questions. My background, as Ramesh said, for the last 15 or so years, I've worked at big companies helping build products for billions, things like Gmail, Google Docs, Google Drive, Google News, Google Photos, Blogger, Reader. And we think about scale at Google. You know, We have a, a name for products that reach the 50 million market 
50 million monthly active user mark at Google. We call those failures. Those are not you know, what we're aspiring to. We want products that really serve humanity, serve the world. Um, so we think a lot about scale, and uh, it's from that perspective I'll be peppering uh, Steve with some questions. So yeah. um, first of all, I think you know the first quarter of your presentation was super depressing. <laughs> we not only have the current running in the wrong direction, it's increasing in velocity, it's accelerating, and you know, it seems like all of the trends are uh, against us. And yet, I sort of feel like you're uh, an optimist, yep. mostly. And you know, the, the three quarters uh, and the second half really help me realize there's rays of light. But um, you know, tell me, are you an optimist? And I'm not, I'm not sure that the examples you invoked, although I'm very fond of Pokemon Go myself and you know, Flux as well, um, is there reason to be hopeful that some of these methodologies that you're pointing to can lead to reversing what seems to be an accelerating current? Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm definitely an optimist. Um, and I think part of the reason I, I'm an optimist is I think about sort of the ethos of people who build things in the tech world. Uh, because there has always been this amazing can-do attitude. Um, that that you can change the world with your products, and you know you and you and your colleagues have. And I think that um, you know when I think about you know people like you know Henry Ford and, and Elon Musk and, and Steve Jobs, and I mean these are people that that took on unreasonable challenges um, and and delivered on them um, in fantastic ways. And so I mean in some ways what I'm really hoping to appeal to is that. Um, I don't know if it's pride or that, that sense of like we are here to do amazing things and it's possible um, and there is a history of doing amazing things. Um, you know, I think, I think the products I was talking about, they're minor, right? I, I mean, they're sort of directionally illustrative, um, but I think, I think we need much bigger things. Um, and I think there's, uh, you know, sometimes I think about it is that there is a sort of green space opportunity where I think a lot of companies can create products and services that work in this direction, and they're going to make a lot of money doing it. Um, and there are going to be cases where companies are like, yeah, if we were to do that, we would be foregoing you know, a lot of revenue on the product we have right now that's do going in the opposite direction. And I think, I think that's a real conflict, um, and we may have to deal with that in other ways. So another thing that you brought up was sort of the difference between push and pull and uh, different approaches toward the problem. Um, both the individual and the collective, you know, they're sort of meta themes resonating through the talk. Um, what role do you think regulatory uh, compliance and sort of coming in over the top and basically saying, we have to do something about this, not at the individual yeah. level or using innovation, but using uh, sticks yeah. uh, as opposed to carrots, like what role do you think that plays in getting us to a better place? So. I think a lot of this is hard to regulate, so I, I think I think we have to think about sticks broadly. Um, you know, there's a fundamental challenge I think with externalities in in, econo in economics. You know, I mean, in some ways, so much of what we've had evolve in in health is the result of companies serving the purpose that those companies were designed for really, really well, and having these sort of side effects that, you know, they weren't intentional necessarily. <laughs> Food companies, I don't know, but, um, uh, and, and yet there's no sort of economic mechanism to kind of capture that and sort of feed that back so there's an accounting um, for it. So I, I think that might be an area that, you know, again, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done to do that, and, and I think the calculations of that thing, those sorts of things are not gonna be easy. I think that's one area. I mean, the other area that I think could be interesting is, um, if we can start to do some estimates or even even qualitative sort of assessments of how different products affect health, you know, you can start to put a little bit of, spot, of a spotlight on that and to be able to show that, hey, here's a product we all love, but guess what? It's having this sort of negative impact, you know, at scale. And, and you know, is that a way to start to get companies to pay attention? Um, I mean, you, you, you would have a good sense in some ways, um, uh, particularly also the role of branding. Mm -hmm. these days, and, and branding and also, I would imagine, recruiting um, yeah. in terms of sort of feeling as a company that you are one of the good guys. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, speaking from experience, I think the things are, you're saying are true. I think there is definitely a spirit at Google that we're undaunted by challenges, you know, the impossible or the unlikely. We'll, we'll take those on, and we have the resources and the human capital to do some of that. And as you're saying, I think there are many people with great intentions and good hearts who sort of recognize the phenomenon you're pointing out to and want to be part of the solution for themselves, for their children, for society. Um, and the best outcomes are when we can get alignment yeah. between you know, doing right by long-term goals and also providing something that people want and is an uh, active, thriving business. And you pointed towards some ways we can do that and some, some real examples of building thriving businesses um, that aren't um, you know, distasteful medicine but are you right. know, things that people actually enjoy and, and want to use. A question I have is around geographies, and I think your own work, at least with the foundation, is mostly focused on the U.S. Yeah. Um, can you point to other examples throughout the world or throughout history, maybe it's Scandinavian countries or you know, other places where they have successfully reversed the stream or, or worked toward, maybe it's newer it's countries like Israel or Singapore where they're more you know, planned. Um, yeah. Are there examples that we can point to that have been inspirational? Yeah, so um, a couple of different ways of thinking about that. One is uh, we were actually just having a conversation about blue zones, which if you don't know the blue zones work, it's quite interesting. It's, it's a study of, I think it's nine places in the world that had an unusual number of people living to be 100. Um, and the author sort of went around to them and tried to understand some common themes. And, and in a lot of cases, these are the countries that were sort of pre-industrialized, um, or the places that there's a deeper connection with nature, and the family bonds are stronger, and, and social, connect, social capital is, is great. Um, so there's that aspect. Um, I think the, uh, you know, the Scandinavian companies do, countries do a really great job of things like infrastructure and public transportation and sort of a small is beautiful approach uh, to the world that I think are very successful. The question is about reversal, which I think is really interesting. And I don't know a ton about this, but what I've seen uh, about Amsterdam, uh, which is a place you think of, oh my gosh, everybody bikes all the time. It's this sort of cycling, walking paradise. Um, in the early 70s, they had gone full on car. Um, and it was a mess. Um, and you know, there were traffic accidents constantly, pedestrians getting killed, and they said, no more. We want to change this. So, so we sometimes have this myth that a place like Amsterdam has always been that way. Uh, but they actually did turn it around consciously. Can I yeah. ask a question here to both of you? Uh, are these problems because health was always considered a problem rather than aspiration? We did not want to improve our health. We did not think of good health, etc. We only thought about health when we had a problem. Mm. Okay. And that's why all these problems are happening here because we are always thinking, I need to solve this problem. We are not thinking about <coughs> aspiring to good health. And this is related to some discussion that you and I had that ultimately we are interested in quality of life, yeah. not really health. But quality of life is intimately related to health. I, I do think that, that that is part of it. And I think there is sort of a tendency is that we like to identify problems, you know, uh, problems that we can sort of sometimes narrowly target and then go off and solve them, um, as opposed to seeking to maximize a positive thing. Um, and that may be just sort of the way culturally that we, we tend to think. Um, uh, but I mean, a lot of times when we, you know, I, I, I work at a foundation whose motto for a really long time, or mission statement, was to improve health and healthcare. And when we would talk about that, people would go, what do you mean? What what's mm. health and healthcare like? Well, how are you distinguishing those? And I think that's still true today. People kind of look at you a little funny, um, and we say, well, healthcare is like you know medical treatment. It's like what happens when you when you get sick. And health is about everything in your life that that, that leads you to be healthy and well. Um, but that's a distinction that is not widely sort of internalized, I think, in our country. Yeah, and I think you're hitting on something really important that. Healthcare is a multi-billion dollar business, and health, or lack of health, is... Four trillion. Four trillion, yeah, yeah. Four trillion dollar business is a huge part of our GDP and economy, and, um, but health is, is not really that. It, 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 it's, 
And so the economic engines of health, that part of what you're teasing out is sort of how can we um, create alignment so that uh, we can reduce the cost of health care and improve the quality of health for people. So it's really interesting to contemplate that uh, distinction, which is embedded in the, the charter of the foundation. Um, should I turn it over uh, to, to you all? We have about 15 minutes, and I have many more questions if you don't, but I um, want to take uh, an opportunity to hand this off, and I'm happy to let Ramesh moderate this. Yeah. Okay. Should we run the mic? I can run the mic okay. here. I can speak up. Yeah, well, we're recording it as well. Hi, uh, Tim Bruckner uh, in public health at UCI. Brian Quinn at RWJ. Is oh, yeah. Mine, so he's, he yeah. said I should definitely attend this talk. So. Uh, thank you. I, I, hope I, I hope you didn't steer you wrong. <laughs> no, it's, it's uh, as advertised. Great. Um, so my question is about whether, in your estimation, technology has the ability to potentially address the geographic disparities in health that you showed up. So, for example, in Harlem versus, uh, you know, the southern part of Manhattan, or if you think about partitioning life expectancy by race ethnicity, yeah. if you essentially remove African Americans from the United States uh, plot, you get a convergence with the European countries. Um, so if you think, okay, how has Google or how have technologies potentially been um, disseminated, those tend to have a strong socioeconomic patterning whereby people like us in this room use it, and those who are maybe not in this room use it less. So what are your thoughts about that and opportunities for the future? Um, so I have a couple of thoughts, and I'd, I'd actually love, love for you to jump in on this um, as well, Bradley. But I think the, um, so one of the, let me see if I can get this right. Part of the issue is when it's hard for everyone, it advantages those that have the resources uh, to struggle. And so the idea of saying, let's create uh, a society in which it's less of a struggle for all is part of how I think you start to bring that about. I mean, that directionally true. And then, then there comes the question of, can we do that you know, with, with, with technology? Um, and I mean, the interesting thing is, is that I think a lot of technologies, you know, certainly over the long run, have been fundamentally democratizing. You know, they have brought more capability and more resources to everyone. Um, you know, often in the short run, it's, it's you know, the early adopters. I mean, I, I think Google's sort of interesting because the an Android is, is the, actually the phone of choice, you know, in, in lower income communities. Um, and in a lot of cases, it sort of became the leapfrog. Um, you know, sort of communities that, that did not have access to other services got them through that, that mechanism. Um, so I think, it, I think it's, tricky um, because I think there is this sort of paradox, you know, sort of this equity paradox of the long run being able to create democratizing technologies that offer more opportunity for more people and in the short run hitting the more advantaged who are more readily able to take advantage of it. Um, and so I think that's the, the challenging paradox there. But. Yeah. I'll add just a few comments. Um, one of the product philosophies at Google, and I think this is credit to Marissa Meyer is build for the power user. And there's a corollary which I added, which is, and make every user a power user. So at any instant in time, what we're trying to do is anticipate what will eventually become uh, commonplace for, for all users. An example would be Gmail. I don't think many of you are old enough to remember when you'd go home at night having filed away every email you had into a folder, you'd sort of close your laptop and then in the morning you'd have six new ones. Um, that's not how it works now, right? We, we can't be filers, we have to be pilers. And we saw this, the early adopters at Google, that eventually Gmail would provide infinite storage and search as a mechanism to get through and automatic filtering using AI and things like that. And I think that this is where we all are now and we all depend on that. In the same way, the example that Steve used with Tesla, first Elon built a car for billionaires that was about this high off the ground and really expensive, but it was all part of a plan to democratize electric vehicles, make them accessible and available to everyone, and now the Model 3 is a very competitive car that compromises on no dimension. Um, so I think part of what you're seeing is that any instant in time, uh, there may be disparity, but the goal is not to increase that disparity, it's to close that gap and 
hopefully the leading adopters those upstream swimmers are part of a movement that brings everyone along with them the last one yeah Hi, I'm, I'm Jody Marbles. I'm the dietitian on campus, and my, my coworker Natalie and I both work in wellness and nutrition at Student Wellness and Health Promotion. Um, I'm more of a pessimist by nature, so I start to think like technology may be all of the problem often and not the solution. Like, you know, it doesn't cost money to park further on campus and, and walk or um, to get something pretty cheap and nourishing like oatmeal, but when there's four Starbucks on campus, it's hard when we see food or surrounded. So I think of like working as a dietitian individually is so rewarding, but from the public policy perspective and fighting like big business, um, I just finished a book called uh, How Not to Diet. That was also written by the person who wrote How Not to Die, Dr. Gregerman, and it, it talks a lot about, it's all about money, right? It's all yeah. about money with big business, big food, technology. So I'm just curious, like, and, and also you're talking about the pushing and pulling and we know working in motivational interviewing, getting people to connect to their intrinsic kind of values is so important, but it's it's pretty challenging. It, it is. Um, no, I... I I mean, I, I, there's no question that, that you, we can go in different directions with technology, um, and that you know, sort of the combination of, of, of technology and sort of the way we do financial markets here and, and what companies are rewarded for has, has led us in a path that, that hasn't been great. And some of it goes back to the externalities that I was talking about, finding ways to hold companies to account for the, the sort of collateral damage. Um, Even Europe has done a way better job than the U.S. Like they can get Kellogg's or General Mills to make their cereals with lower sodium and sugar, but the yeah. U.S. doesn't demand. Yeah, like, right. No, yeah. and, and there is a lot of this that, that is politics. I mean, I, I want to be really clear in saying I don't think the answer to everything is technology. Um, and 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 there's a lot of stuff that's just flat out policy work <laughs> needs to be done. Um, a lot of it is just flat out justice work um, that needs to be done. Um, and I think I think. You know, technology is also most impactful often when it comes with associated changes in infrastructure and associated changes in policy. Um, and if I think about, um, one of my favorite examples of this is electric scooters. If you drop electric scooters onto a city with no other changes, you know, it's sort of a recipe for chaos and injuries and all of those things. If you look at electric scooters and say, this is a really interesting new mode of transportation that can have a lot of value, let's think about how we introduce those with changes in infrastructure and rules and regulations about how they would use, be used, you could be really impactful in a positive way. So sometimes it's the integration of those three, or the alignment of those three, um, that really matters. Or straight out good policy, starting from city planning, right? So there's no need for technology there. If you have a better city planning, already the health is improved quite a bit. That way there is walking and uh, buying things. You don't need to use scooters and uh, uh, and uh, then just walk. So the city planning itself, basically, going back to the question of a couple of questions, right? Yeah. One is basically uh, from individualism, you want to move towards collectivism. That's that's very good. And going back to the other question is basically uh, uh, the uh, big businesses are bad and things like that. What uh, what I see is the solutions that you propose. Uh, is basically how to leverage capitalism towards uh, better health. Now, uh, in the collectivism part of it, uh, the, uh, the collective uh, force of uh, society has to force the capitalistic so, uh, products and other things towards the alignment of capital. So it's a chicken and egg problem. Do you want to push the uh, companies, big corporations, towards helping society to move in the direction, or you want to push the society to force the companies to move in the direction, that's one part. But if you move the society to move in the, uh, to force companies to move in a certain direction, automatically you can influence the policies of the government too. So what, uh, what is fundamental in this entire conversation I see is, uh, it's better to uh, like uh, address the society 
and then ask them to change as a collective society, which will influence both capitalistic world as well as policy world. Yeah. Uh, rather than uh, working with the government uh, agencies and, and uh, this thing separately individual. Before you answer yeah. that question, uh, there was uh, this, uh, I, I don't remember who said it, but 200 years ago, somebody argued that there is no concept of society. It's only individuals that matter. And society is just a collection of individuals. And uh, he was basically arguing that if you learn how do we change the behavior of individuals, then you can change society. Mm -hmm. hmm. So, um, no, I, 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 I really get what you're saying, and I think that, I mean, I guess the way I think about it is, is there's no sort of one right starting place. These things are dynamic, and I mean, there are, I mean, there's some interesting things happening in terms of sort of, you know, the, the critiques of capitalism these days, and you have, um, uh, you know, BlackRock saying that they only want to invest in companies that, that are doing good as well as making money. Um, you have the business roundtable saying it's got to be more than share, share, shareholder value. And there's lots of suggestion that those things are toothless. Um, but they're there for a reason. You know, they're responding to something in sort of the, in, in kind of the, the, the zeitgeist right now. Um, you know, we were talking earlier about um, sort of the ability to recruit, you know, uh, at companies. And so there, there is something going on, I think, socially about saying, kind of unfettered capitalism that is just purely making money no matter who it hurts is not a good thing and, 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 and we're trying to figure out solutions to that. So that will probably move very slowly, um, but, but you could argue that it, it, it's a tailwind. Um, and so I, I think there is this notion again, that there are areas where companies can just flat out make money and do good at the same time, and then there are areas where it's going to come into conflict and that's where you need kind of the social change. I think that, that sort of makes that a little harder to do than maybe it was in the past. But again, this is hard stuff. <laughs> it's really hard stuff. I mean, stuff. I think like Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat is like an example of like these companies who are trying to promote like some interesting like to, to not choose beef and then like the big chain fast food restaurants are implementing mm -hmm. it. And I mean, there's a debate on whether it is like yeah. healthy and Franken food and stuff, but, but that kind of comes to mind for me as like kind of that benevolent kind of capitalistic but trying to help yeah and, and I think the I the actually it also raises for me a, a, I think a point that I wanted to make as well which is that there's actually some nice concordance between things that are good for lowering carbon emissions and good for health um, that can be leveraged here um, as well a lot of the stuff around mobility and different forms of transportation as well as food uh, as well so one of the things that I hear from lots of people is that in healthcare, almost because of four trillion dollars, almost all the major companies, starting from Google to Apple to Amazon, are very much interested in this. Now, what? How does that effort from those companies fit in with the idea that you are proposing here? I would like to hear from both of you. Yes, yeah, so to me that gets into the vertical versus horizontal thing, and and I think it. I mean, what I would hope to see from those companies is both and, yeah. right? I mean, clearly there's. I mean, I don't want to pretend that there are no interesting problems in healthcare, and we don't have, you know, a lot of important solutions to be developed in healthcare. Uh, it's a four trillion dollar industry that could be much, much, much better, and so having Google and Amazon and Apple wanting to try to make improvements in that is a great thing. Um, so at the same time. You know, I, w I would love for them to take that horizontal view and look across their full range of products and say, how can we improve health with each of these? Um, and, you know, again, that, that's certainly going to take time, but I do hope it's a both end. Yeah, it certainly is at Google. I mean, we do recognize, and I think for us it's less than, you know, there's a $4 trillion market and more we have technology that we legitimately think can improve the situation. You know, Google tried something called Google Health about, 12 years yeah, ago, maybe 13, and we sort of came into the room with great enthusiasm and thought we could solve a problem. And what we discovered is, is it wasn't just a technology problem. There were forces greater than we realized. So when we came in with our technology, we sort, sort of retreated very fast and got shown the door. We're coming back humbler and with a little bit more savvy about uh, patience and all it will take to make a difference. 
But we do have uh, an emerging division called Google Health. We've hired some amazing talent into that group. And we're looking at places where technology really can make an immediate difference. So um, retinopathy, diagnostics, things where we're not trying to replace doctors, but provide them with new tools that can improve their ability to scale and put their precious attentions on the right problems. Um, so uh, the answer is both. We, we do have a legitimate healthcare practice where we attempt to help there, but we acknowledge that uh, every product we make has a health implication and we need to start owning that implication and doing the right thing by our users. Uh, what's the relationship between Google Health and Verily? Because you have <laughs> other company, Verily. Yeah, I'm certainly not qualified to answer that question. <laughs> you know, we have a complicated structure at Google, much like academia. There's probably many places on this campus and many departments represented in this room. And similarly, there's Google Brain and uh, Google Fitbit is now a Google, Google you know, definitely. acquisition and Verily, which is our life sciences division. So I think Calico. Calico. Philosophically, I think it's let a thousand flowers bloom and you know see where innovation emerges that makes a difference and sort of double down on those. So we have a philosophy that we don't really have a top-down approach toward innovation, but we rather really want to let the talent emerge in a bottoms-up way. And um, so it's complicated, but it works. Uh, Steve, I know you have been very dedicated to uh, seeing uh, has become the part of operating system of the society. And uh, when you think about that, what do you think about the politics? And what do you think about the companies? Because every health election, health healthcare is one of the top issues, including this one. Yeah, so um, uh, so first as a, as a representative of the Broadway Johnson Foundation, I have to do really careful talking about politics. That's sort of, we, have, we have legal restrictions on that. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think one of the things, and, and again, it gets back to that notion that most of the political debate around health is actually about health care. It's about health insurance and how we pay for health insurance. Um, and you know, it's not like the candidates are getting up there talking about this stuff. Yeah. Um, so we just have a, we have a ways to go. Um, uh, I, I think, it, again, it, it's, it's having that horizontal understanding of health and realizing that it's pervasive. I mean, the way we think about it, health is in community designs, health is in family leave policies, you know, health is in giving kids the resources to, to grow up in, 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 in healthy ways, it's in, it's in the access to transportation in a community. I mean, it's all of these things. Um, and unfortunately, I think, I think, you know, people tend to organize things into categories. Um, and this is sort of a category-defining concept um, that, that, that we struggle with. I noticed there are a couple, couple of hands over here. Thanks. I wanted to, to sort of go back and, and part of the, some of the gloom part of this and sort of also thinking about the, what the sort of secondary or negative impacts of technology as they get out into the world and those. And I'm thinking about other successful public health efforts, and in, and in particular, smo around smoking. Yeah. And the importance of norm change yep. as part of that. And I'm wondering, are there technological norms that are developing that we need to be rethinking or thinking about how do we change a norm in, around technology? I mean, to me, one of the greatest norms is that the most important thing we can solve for is convenience. Um, and, and sometimes I, 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 didn't, I spared you from it today, but sometimes I do a riff on the Jetsons um, about sort of the Jetsons is kind of our dominant vision of the future, right? When we think of the future, we think of like George Jetson, or some of us, I mean, people of a certain generation, I think that. Um, but it was, a, it, was a, it was a vision that was fundamentally rooted in convenience. And so if you think about so many, pro, so many technological innovations over the last you know, couple of decades or even more, it's really been about how do we make things a little easier and a little faster uh, for people, and that that's the right way to think about the problem? Um, and in many ways, it's you know economically proven so. Um, but it is a norm that that I think, you know, as it turns out, having a really kind of convenient life is not necessarily the healthiest life. Um, and so that is a norm that I would think we have to rethink. Hi. 
Thank you for the nice talk. I'm your money from nursing in CS. So I have a question, basically it's not a question, I want a comment from your side regarding some of the points that you discussed in the presentation. You had this notion of or the fact that we need more tools to assess the impact. And also the other side you mentioned about uh, you're seeking like this push space thing like for having personalized solutions for public problems. This is one part, this is the second part, and then this upstream aspect, right? But what if some of these uh, upstream kind of issues are personalized? For example, what if these there can be tools like to measure impacts rather than just solutions and see, for example, maybe the the, re the way the reason that I'm winning gate uh, gaining weight, sorry, is because maybe this special food is a problem for me, or maybe the fact that I'm stressed is because there are certain issues that make me as personally stressed. So more tools to really look at a person, and maybe some of these upstreams are just my upstreams, like, and yeah. I, it can help me to cope with those. I, I think that makes sense. I, I, I think that, um, I mean, again, I, I really think this is a both and, 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 and that we have to continue to help people individually to struggle. Um, and we have to try to change the conditions so that it's not so much of a struggle. And I do think that, you know, you, you're right that there are a number of things that, um, and actually, I, I was a big funder of N, N, N of one studies and, and that whole quantified self-movement. There is a lot of self-knowledge to be gained through self-measurement. I think my concern is that it hasn't aggregated to population-wide impact. Um, and again, it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be done. Uh, it just means that I think to have population-wide impact, we have to also work on the, on the societal conditions as well. Any more questions? Then, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bradley.